welcome to the works of Jeffrey Ford with Rob Cameron, Emma J. Gibbon, John Langham, and Langan, and Sarah Pinsker and Paul Cover. Take it away. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon to talk about the works of one of ReaderCon's guests of, of honor this year, Jeffrey Ford. Uh, I'm John Langan. I'll be your moderator, and I'll try just to moderate and uh, not uh, wade into things too much because we have a fantastic panel and I'm eager as I'm sure you are to hear what they have to say about, uh, about Jeff's work. So I'm gonna ask everybody um, if you would uh, first introduce yourselves. Um, we can do that uh, alphabetically if that's okay. Uh, so that means, uh, Emma, would you introduce yourself first, please? Hi, my name's Emma Gibbon. I'm a horror writer, speculative poet, and librarian. My short fiction collection, Dark Blood Comes From the Feet, came out last year. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, could you introduce yourself next, please? Hello, my name's Cameron. For me online, it's Rob Cameron. Uh, I am managing editor of the Clydecast uh, uh, story podcast, uh, organizer for Brooklyn Speculative Fiction Writers, and I have uh, essays in uh, Foreign Policy Magazine and stories in Clockwork Phoenix and other places. And uh, yeah, that's who I am. I'm usually in Brooklyn, but today I'm in Rochester, New York. Okay. Sarah, I just realized that I have no alphabetical skills because a P comes before. Anyway, Sarah, would you introduce yourself next, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Sarah Pinsker. I, uh, I'm a science fiction, fantasy, and horror writer. Uh, I have about 50-ish uh, short stories out, a collection from Small Beer, and uh, two novels, one of which came out this year. Thank you. And, uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Paul Woodcover. I am a, a speculative fiction writer. Uh, my new novel, uh, Lincoln Stein, is coming out in September from PS Publishing. Um, I'm an uh, editor, freelance editor, and uh, I'm also the uh, associate dean of the uh, online MFA uh, in creative writing at Southern New Hampshire University. Okay, so this is uh, this is a great panel of people to put together uh, to talk about Jeff Ford's work. Um, so, uh, you know, I thought we would just sort of do the, in some ways, the traditional thing. Um, how is it that you became aware of, of Jeff's work? Um, uh, what was your, just sort of your early introduction to it? Um, obviously, Jeff's been writing for a little while now, so, so there is a, a body of work to, to look over. Um, so I, I suppose one of the things I'm interested in in this sort of opening round of, of, of questions and, and comments is, is have you, how long have you been following his work? Um, did you, are you a relatively uh, uh, new, uh, new reader of Jeff's work or is this, is his work something that you've been following for a long time? And, and um, I suppose therefore, you know, have you seen any changes, trends, that sort of stuff? Uh, I suppose answering this could just take us the rest of the panel. Anyway, let's see where we go. So uh, this time I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order. So Paul, you're first. Uh, okay. Um, when I first uh, moved in, moved to New York City, I, I worked as a, uh, uh, you know, pretty much freelance, uh, any kind of job I could get that was related to the publishing world. Uh, and one of the things I did was write cover copy uh, for Avon Books. Um, and I became friendly with the copy chief there, a guy named Josh Frank. Uh, and he's the one back in the late 90s who said, we both shared an interest in speculative fiction. And he said, have you read anything by this guy, Jeff Ford? And Avon at that time was just publishing the, uh, the first or, or, or second of the well-built city books. And I said, no, I've never heard of him. Uh, he handed me the, the physiognomy and that was it. Um, I was hooked. And ever since then, I have followed his work pretty assiduously. I, I work on a, a number of his collections for small beer. I worked on your book too, Sarah, which I really enjoyed, by the way. And um, uh, so I'm probably a little bit more familiar with his short fiction than his, uh, than his novels, although I recently read the, the most recent one, uh, Ahab's Return. Um, and I think that a lot of the distinctive qualities of his work were apparent from the start. I would say if he's changed, it's only become, only to become more uh, who he was in the first place. He's, he's let those elements of his writing personality really uh, shine. Okay, and uh, Cameron, how about you? 
To be honest, I can't recall when I exactly first came across Just Before. I do know, or his writing rather, I do know that it was seeing him in person. Uh, he you know, frequents a KGB uh, for Ellen, and I heard him read, and I was just kind of kind of stunned. Uh, and then I picked up uh, Crackpot Palace, and that he was there, and he was promoting that short story collection. And um, I, I, that's the first anthology, I think, since Neil Gaiman's Fragile Things of one author that I read from beginning to end. And I think I was using it almost like text. I, most books, I don't write a lot in it, but I'm like highlighting in my notes. And so you can see my, my commentary. Wow, I can't believe he, that he did that in the work and just had me kind of mind blown. Um, I don't know if I would say like, like Paul, uh, if I notice any change. Uh, I will say, I think that some of the, like the last anthology I have of him, The Drowned Life, seems a bit, I feel like there's a bit more of him in the storytelling, uh, rather his voice in telling the stories, which I like quite a bit. Um, but other than that, it's just, I think, the same, more wonderfulness <laughs> coming from him. Very nice. I hope Ford is watching this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Sarah, how about you? I, I actually know exactly what the first story I read was. It was The Empire of Ice Cream which I completely fell in love with. It had everything I, I like in a story. It, you know, it's, it's about music and it's about uh, shifting realities and, and um, things that may or may not be what they seem. And um, it was so beautifully written and so well, like uh, the synesthesia was so well described. All of the, every choice he made seemed to be perfect. And I was just, um, so happy about it. Um, I think it was, the collection was already out by then, but uh, it was probably 2010. And uh, like 2008 to 2010 was when I was starting to um, come back uh, after sort of not reading for a while. I was doing nothing but music. Like 2008 to 2010, I was catching up on genre work again. So I hadn't read anything of his before that. And then I read a whole bunch uh, at that point. Like the, um, I know that the first novel I read was uh, The Shadow Year, is that true? Hold on, The Girl in the Glass and The Shadow Year, and then um, some of the collections. And I, yeah, I was, I was just chasing down everything. And I, I've been chasing down everything ever since. Fair enough. And Emma, how about you? It's, it's hard to know. Like on the one hand, I, I could have been reading him for a long time, but I only became aware of it being him recently. So it, it's kind of like when before, Back in the olden days when you used to hear a song on the radio and you really liked it, but it would be really hard to find the title or the, or the singer. And so like if you're me, you're of an age where you're frantically trying to look on them on YouTube at night, um, at the weekends, because you can't remember what they were called. That's how I became aware of, of Jeff's stories. I read a lot of collections. I read a lot of anthologies and I do have favourites, but I don't always know who's written them. I'll know it's, it's the one with or even the title the great thing about it now is that I can look back on those and when I look back it's like oh Jeff Ford oh Jeff Ford Jeff Ford and so I've been enjoying his work for far longer than I was ever really aware of him and so it was when I think it was the last in-person reader con when I I met him and I think you introduced me to him John um and it was then when I started looking back and like, wait a minute, I'm actually a big fan of this guy. And I never even knew I'd been reading his short stories and his novellas for years. Um, so so it's recent, but also way back. Sure, sure. Yeah, he's he's I feel like there's this sort of moment where you realize, oh, my God, I've been reading this guy and he's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I suppose um, there are a few things I, I wanted to, to think about. You know, first off, Paul mentioned that that initial um, trilogy of novels, the the, the well built city trilogy, I guess it's it's called now, right? The um, and um, uh, I, I've not read. I have, to, I have to admit myself, I haven't read. Uh, Jeff has a, a his first novel, uh, Vanitas, which he sort of uh, repudiates and downplays. Where I've not read that, so I, I I can't I can't speak to that. Um, and I think that was published maybe in the early nineties. Um, but but he, in terms of his novels, what, what's fascinating, I, I think about his novels is the way that you, know, you get that initial weird fantasy trilogy. And then um, you move into to three works which are more historically inflected, um, The Girl in the Glass, 
um, and uh, the portrait of Mrs. Sharbuk and uh, and the shadow here. And then most recently, we've, we've had Ahab's return, which is um, a sort of literary historical uh, fantasia. Um, and it's it's tempting, I I, I want to say, to almost sort of like divvy up his his career and into you know according to those uh, those groupings of, of fiction. But as as you've all said, uh, and I think especially um, uh, Paul and Cameron were saying, you know, the, the, there are these strands that, that that run throughout his his career, so that the the autobiographical stuff shows up all over the place, um, and that the crazy fantastical stuff shows up all over the place. So um, one of the things I thought we might I wanted to ask was, was what do you see as, um, you know, he writes a fantasy trilogy, right? So, so if you wanted to, oh yeah, Jeff, he wrote a fantasy trilogy, but the well-built city is not like um, most other fantasy trilogies. Certainly it's not like the Lord of the Rings. Um, and that's no knock on Tolkien, just it's, it's very, very different from it. Um, I had the thought that, that, you know, when I first noticed Jeff, it was as part of a group of writers that included uh, Jeff Vandermeer, um, and Jeffrey Thomas and Michael Sisko, and uh, to a certain extent, Kelly Link and, and Andy Duncan. Um, and then later on, uh, Paul, you and he were part of the Inferior Four um, at, uh, uh, with uh, Lucia Shepard and Liz yeah. Hand, um, right. fighting crime, yeah. um, <laughs> fighting mediocrity in writing. Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to sort of you know, throw a bunch of ideas out there at the at the beginning. Um, now that we, we've sort of established how how long everybody has has been reacting to Jeff's work, and I just wanted to to sort of throw out a bunch of ideas and and you know sort of see what sticks to the wall, see what what you guys uh, respond to. Um, let's uh, let's mix it up, Sarah. Why don't you go first this time? <laughs> I'm actually not entirely sure what the question was in there, but but uh, I, I think if we're talking about like the, the characteristics that make a Jeff Ford piece a Jeff Ford piece, I, I think I think it is interesting what you said about the novels having sort of a different flavor than than the short fiction. Like I, if I if I read only his short fiction, there were you you would still have some of the fantasy, you would still have some of the historical stuff. Um, but you would also say this is a this is a guy who is really good at writing um, a certain kind of contemporary um, uh, creepiness that that I find delicious, like just a um, well placed dread, well placed details. Um, I, it it can creep me out without without ruining my night. Um, I. I um, and then you have these novels that are uh, of the, the uh, that are often uh, note perfect uh, period pieces, um, and you don't need to have read uh, Moby Dick to to just really appreciate the the details that are of of the era that are in Ahab's Return, um, or or uh, Mrs. Sharbuk or the girl in the glass or the shadow you you can just like, like the details just infuse the piece and tell you what's important and what's important to those characters and i think that could that kind of runs through both like you you know what's important to a jeff ford character fairly quickly mm -hmm. yeah it wasn't really a question it was a typical con thing where i just wanted <laughs> to make a statement you know and then say respond to that <laughs> it uh, um paul what about you um i think uh one one important um, characteristic of, of Ford's writing and, and work. Uh, one time I, I saw him read one of my favorite stories, the Annals of Elan Oak. Um, and uh, he got to a certain point and he kind of choked up and he, he said, you know, sort of castigated himself, uh, calling himself a sentimental old man. Um, sorry, Jeff, if you're if you're watching. But um the sentiment in his stories is completely earned. There's nothing trite about anything in his work. And I feel that the same um, uh, forthright honesty that he brings to the depiction or of, of sentiment in his, in his stories, he brings to everything in his stories, the horror, the uh, eeriness, the uncanny elements. 
he takes them all on straight on. And uh, he doesn't bother really trying to like, you know, he, he doesn't set out to scare you like some horror writers do in my opinion. Um, he's telling a story uh, in, in uh, it's almost as though he, he's, uh, he's, um, he's recording something that, that is, that has happened. Um, there's nothing that's beyond the reach of belief in, in his stories. He doesn't approach anything as being unbelievable. He pre approaches everything as being, uh, possible and real. And I think that's what gives his, uh, makes his stories, however strange they may be, and they can become incredibly strange. That's what makes them so compelling. And it, it is what makes readers get on board. Emma, how about you? I think, I think the thing that draws me most to Jeff's work is, um, and there's a lot of things, like a lot of what Paul just said, it, it totally resonated with me. Um, but the, I think it's the audacity, it's the audacity of, the, of Jeff's writing. He, you know, there's, you know, you see people make proclamations about writing, especially online, about what you should or shouldn't do. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. You know, you sh this is what you do. And there's always a little voice in the back of my head that says, well, yeah, but what if I did? And that is what Jeff is. Jeff is that voice of, we'll do it anyway. You know, th there's no sense in any of Jeff's writing that, that he ever, can, you know, that he just goes for it. He just goes like, okay, whatever, I'm going to do it. And, and, it's, and it's backed by an incredible, like, commitment to his writing and commitment to stories and studying stories. So it's coming from a very strong, robust place. But you could, there's no, never any sense that there's any limits to what he'll try or that he'll follow any rules. And I find that very admirable and, and it makes for great reading. And Cameron, how about you? Well, first, let me just say I highly, strongly agree with everything that's been said about his work so far. And this reminds me of the conversation I had one of my uh, with a critique session with another writer and the frustration with cer the certain amount of contrivance that is necessary when you're writing a story to take this thing that is not real, you know, and give it a structure that people will find some sense in. And I think what for me, a lot of times what Jeff, uh, Mr. Ford, Jeff, Mr. Ford Jeff, uh, is doing is he is like he is a reliable narrator for dreams like that what he's doing like my like emma was saying a lot of writers would shy away from it yet everything he's doing does make sense and you you fall into it and particularly in an anthology where you'll have you know strange fiction here you'll have something that's again biographical there the next you don't know at what point he's on the truth he's lying he's making up whatever i think particularly right now this story the relic um, which is this long and just stories within stories, story, short story that ends in a place which you just, you cannot see coming. At the same time, it is deeply satisfying. And you were satisfied from the very first paragraph that he wrote it. You get to the end, it's like, it all makes sense uh, in a Jeffrey, Jeffrey Ford kind of way. Yeah, I what? think that's, uh, I'm sorry, please. Go no, go, ahead. go for it. And I, was, I was just going to say that that ability that he has to take, uh, introduce elements at the beginning of his story a seemingly veer off in unbelievably random directions and then pull everything back to the end so that it just comes together in a beautiful, intuitive way that sometimes isn't even, even plot related plot-wise. It's related on some much deeper level. It just resonates so beautifully with me. And I, I feel like that's one difference from his early stuff to his later stuff. I feel that he's gotten much more, I, I, I love, uh, your your term, Emma, which of course is like now got gone out of my mind. But you you were mentioning like he he is uh, um, uh, shoot. What was the word you used? Audacity. Well, yeah. audacity. But, but also you, you you used some other word that I thought really nailed his uh, his approach to fiction. Of course, I, I, the, what's coming to my mind is authority. That's not what you what you said. But but he, yeah. he his his. his ability to like trust in, in whatever it is that is enabling him to like go way out there and come back, I feel has grown over the years. And in his last collection, especially, I think he's taken it much further than he has before with, with just amazing results. 
Um, he, tell, he tells the story as it has to be, not the story that you expect it to be. Yes. And, and that takes a certain confidence because, because we all know the weight of expectations on us. And we know that to a certain degree, we're, we're trained to, like, like every choice we make, we have to decide whether we're fulfilling audience expectation or subverting audience expectation. And I feel like he, he's aware of that at every turn and mixing it up so that you don't, so, so yeah, you're constantly guessing about that and it rarely ends up at the expected place, but it's, I don't know if I can always put subversion on it, but, but uh, I just, yeah, the stories, the stories go to these places that you would not have said, this is where, this is where an out of body story would go. This is where a haunted house story would go. Here's another haunted house story. It's also going to go somewhere else. And it's not about the thing that you think it is after all, but I gave you those clues and they're there. You just, you just didn't really, you thought that the story was about something else. And, and his, his skill at doing that just, just always impresses me. Yeah, and, and you know, what, what else I think he's extremely good at, and, and, and this is really illustrated by one of my favorite stories of his, or by anybody, that story under the bottom of the lake. Um, he's incredibly generous as far as um, being open in his methods and his thought processes to readers. I mean, he doesn't, he's not a writer that is like going out of his way to hide things. You know, he's the kind of magician that works like in front of an audience with, with like, no misdirection or anything. It's all, all there and marvel all the more because he is so open and transparent about what he's doing on the page. You never feel cheated either by the ending, even though it's not, it's rarely what you would, there's never an, an idea that you would have expected that ending. You don't feel cheated because he's led you there. He's, he's, he's shown you the way there quite openly um, while subverting your expectations at the same time. And that's why it's so satisfying because you can go back and see where, he, where he's come from to get you there. Uh, there's a story, I forget the title that he did, and it is, it's a vampire story. You know, it kind of reminds me of Buffy a little bit, but Buffy's not the main character in the story. It's her boyfriend, I guess. And it's taking this character who, who, um, end up kind of being like a warrior into this world and and something that you know with vampires it, it gets used again and again and again so you're constantly trying to find something new and and he did and it wasn't about the vampires and it wasn't about you know they're there and it wasn't about you know the, the hunt that's not what it was about it really was about you know this person's relationship and and you're satisfied again at the end of that Cameron, yeah. was that in the i feel like that was in ellen datlow's young uh, adult anthology. Yes, Teeth was yes. it? Because I, 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 yes. I, I know, and I cannot remember the title either, which is great for the moderator, right? But it is a, it is a wonderfully poignant story that that starts off as you said. It's as if it's from Buffy, the the the, you know, the boyfriend who comes into this crazy sitting thing. the dead, sitting the dead, sitting the dead, sitting yeah, the yeah. dead. And and it just it goes it's it's utterly nuts it's it's which I, I often feels right for a Jeff Ford story like well of course, but but it it you it ends up in this very very poignant uh, place. Um, I, I'm really fascinated um, with with what all of you have been saying about the kind of um, I, I want to say emotional authenticity of the of the stories, however however crazy they they may get. Um, and I wonder, um, I don't know if this is, I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't know if this is a question, but um, <laughs> just, I just want to throw out the idea that, 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 that there's, there's some way in which for all of the insanity of, of a Jeff Ford story, for all of the, uh, the, the shifting plot, that there is that sort of, there's some kind of core of, of emotional authenticity to, to what he's doing. And maybe that's difficult to pin down, but, but I wonder if we could talk about or around that a, a, a little bit more um what um how it is that ford does that how how it is that he earns that that emotion in his in his story so that we don't feel oh of course he killed the kid and of course he's going to make us cry you know it's 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 a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of thing i wonder if anyone has any thoughts on that i am um, i so can i um, can i read you this is my I've like, I've got a book, the book with the sticky and everything. Oh, okay, this, sure. Oh yeah, this is one you of my came favorite. Prepared. I, I did. I'm a librarian. Oh, uh, okay. Well, 
Um, this is one of my, honestly, my favourite like couple of lines from a story, and it's from The Blameless, which is the one where a suburban couple are invited to an exorcism. But it's like a like a suburban party. So so the wife is trying to to convince the the husband to go to this, you know, exorcism. Like the latest thing is like all of the like bougie people are ex getting exorcisms for their teens. Um, and so he's like, I have zero interest. And she says, You're going, she said. You were just sitting here five minutes ago carrying on about some fucking cucumber salad. You need to get out of the house. It's that kind of like dialogue between the characters, which, which is totally down to earth and you totally believe. And I totally imagine Lynn saying it to Jeff once, <laughs> he's gonna, you know, definitely. Because I hear a lot of these stories now in Jeff's voice, like he's yeah. telling them to me. Um, and, and with that kind of thing, I'm like, you know what, I'm in. And I'll follow it. I'll follow him anywhere. I'll follow him in all kinds of situations because he's already established to me that those characters are real and feel like flesh and blood and they're the kind of people you know. So you do believe them emotionally, no matter what crazy stuff happens, because he's already to, he's, he's grounded them for you. He's talked about the cucumber salad and the cucumber salad does keep men be mentioned all the way through, which is one of my favorite things. It, he still carries it on the whole way through the story, even when a girl's been exercised or whatever. But, but that's what it is to me. It's that down to earth. Yeah. Or like there was another um, description where he describes a smell as um, if, if a shit had a shit. Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? And he writes beautifully, but also that's beautiful to me as well. And that's what's going to get carry me along to a story. <laughs> and, you know, even in stories where, where it, with another writer, and I'm thinking specifically of like a story like Blood Drive, you know, where, the, you know, another writer would say, okay, here's a message story, right? Here's a, here's like a social problem that I'm going to address. And, you know, Blood Drive is a message story. There's no doubt about it, but but it's so much more than that because of the very elements that you just mentioned, because these characters are so beautifully grounded and because the end of the story, once again, kind of comes in an unexpected direction or comes from an unexpected direction. You realize, oh my God, this is not the story I thought I was reading. It's so much more than that. And I think again and again and again, that's a magic that he's able to pull off. I wish I knew how. I think you and me he, both, yeah. yeah. It, the last time I saw him at KGB, he was reading from something something new. I don't think it had been published yet. I think he actually had it on, reading it off a printed paper. And then he got a chance to tell Someone asked him about his, his process and when he's teaching kind of what he's talking about. And I think he said, like, he's not, he's not a planner. You know, no. he doesn't do outlines. Um, and it's just a really strong connection to his subconscious and kind of letting it flow. I, I, I wonder, you know, if he gets a chance to come in here, how many drafts he's going through, you know, what is he, yeah. when he's going back and through it, you know, does he, does he, did he already, it almost seems exploratory to me as he's going through that process from beginning to end uh, to get to that story. Um, and I, I wonder what kind of what he's doing to, to kind of mine that thing that we finally, that we finally end up with. Well, that, that's one of the reasons I, I love Under the Bottom of the Lake so much, because the, the narrator of that story is, is you know, a writer who's, the writer who's writing that story. And he talks about um, what he does and how ideas come to him and how he mines into that um, kind of unconscious creative layer in himself. It's really beautifully done. And that's what I meant earlier about how transparent Jeff is to his readers about, like, you know, the, the question writers get asked all the time, well, where do your ideas come from? Well, he's like, they come from under the bottom of the lake. I, I think there's something interesting also when we're talking about the emotional honesty that he's, he's someone who's done a lot of uh, self-insert fiction. There are a lot of Jeff Ford characters or Jeff oh, yeah. Ford-like characters. And often you end up with a reserve in the, like you would think you would end up with a reserve because there's a level level of protection you then have to put in. Um, and and it, they, those stories, like everything just seems, uh, like it still hits an emotional core even, even when, I don't really know, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, but, but, but everything still feels emotionally honest even in those stories which, uh, which paradoxically to me would often be the ones that you would think 
would have the step back, um, they'd take a step forward. So uh, can I ask you to clarify, Sarah? I'm, I'm just, I'm fascinated by that idea that, that, that uh, so I think what I hear you saying is that in an autobiograph, or what seems to be an autobiographically inflected story, you would think that, that paradoxically the writer would be a bit more reserved and would be like, here's a persona that I'm putting forth. Having done that myself, yes. Okay. And, 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 and and, but I don't, I don't get that sense with him. I, I, I get the sense that like, he's giving us, he's giving us everything. He's right, even more uh, exposed, as it, as it yeah. were. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating idea, w well, which is what you would that, think, yeah. right? Go ahead, Cameron, I'm sorry. I was going to say, like, also, there's there's this kind of a separation from 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 ego. You know, he's not putting himself into the position of the hero. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, uh, in The Drowned Life, there's another story. It's called The, the Fat One. He's talking about him and his son and hot yeah. dogs. The whole story is about him, yeah, you know, true. getting these hot dogs. And it's he's talking about himself. And, to, and I don't know how much of that he just made up for the story and how much of that, you know, is, is uh, you know, is autobiographical, I'm sure, there, no. There's also the story, I'm blanking on the name, it's at the end of uh, the Fantasy Writer's Assistant. Um, it's, it's an original for the collection. And it's, um, it talks about the time that, that he and Lynn lived uh, in a hotel in Vestal, New York, and mm -hmm. And it goes into all these details that may or may not be true. And it's about a lost Kafka story that, um, uh, that is in a book that no one has a copy of. And he gets a hold of a copy. And, and you get into this room with the guy who's going to auction off the book. And um, there's another guy in the room. And the other guy gets the book. And the other, like, he's some schlub named Jeff Ford. <laughs> um, and and I, I loved the the sleight of hand in that one as well. Where where, yeah, it, it was and it was literally this. It goes on to talk about um, writing, having to write the last story for a collection uh, from that press that his that collection came out from. So it had this like recursive element um, that that was that was just making playing with us in a, in a great way. He's, he he. Some quite often he he makes Lynn the hero, and I I love that Lynn's the hero of these stories, not yeah. Jeff. Jeff's just some guy who happened to be there. He's never really puts himself in a good light. But but Lynn, Lynn's the hero. Um, wasn't there? Go on. There, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Go on. I was gonna say, wasn't there like a act? There's a story where like he's fighting against his double, and then. And then Lynn comes in, I think, and with a gun and shoots the double. I forget. That there's story. one where she fights a monster. I know there's that one, um, but I forget. Was it the double of my double is not my double? Was that I, the the? I think so. I don't remember that, but if I'm hopefully I'm remembering it correctly. I think Lynn does come in and 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 kill the double. It's absolutely true, though, isn't it, that, that Jeff often comes off, whether it's, it's whether he's including his wife in his stories or his sons, he often comes off as, as, as um, you know, the, the sidekick or something like that, the comic relief or something like that. Lynn always gets the best. She always gets the best lines uh, mm -hmm. at his expense. Um, and he's he's quite willing to, to do that. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a story in the new collection. I can't remember the, the name of it right now where uh, uh, and it's set out in Ohio, which is where Jeff and Lynn now live. And it's about the house next door. And they're just fascinated by this house and they wind up sneaking over there and all kinds of hijinks ensue. Um, but, but it's a story in which ni neither one of them are really presented uh, in, in, a, in that great of a light. Uh, he's like, he has to use a cane, he's clumsy, he's falling down all the time. They're, they're both drinking too much. They're doing what they shouldn't. There's poking their noses in where it doesn't belong. They both have a horrible comeuppance, really. And, uh, but the saddest thing of it for me was at the end of the story, they're separated. And, and I just thought, oh no, you can't do that. You can't separate Jeff from Lynn. Fictional Jeff from fictional Lynn. That's like the, separating Laurel from Hardy, you know, it can't yeah. be done. The jeweled yeah, yeah. Wren. That was yeah, the jeweled Wren. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I think about the one that, that is, is fast becoming my favorite, one of my favorites is the last story in that collection. Is it the five point spell? And in that one, he's like, it's in five sections and he's like bouncing you around. He's bouncing you around and talking about 
um, I was working on a story about uh, a museum and you're like, I know that story. I know which one he's talking about. And then he's like, and I was working on this one and then I was going to a reading and you know it's KGB is going to. And so he brings in all these different um all these different elements and and that that really i found myself like getting more and more confused like is he really being was he really being followed by a black pickup did that really happen i know that's where jeff lives and i know that and so there's this meshing of like fictional and real worlds that that leave you you know bouncing around in like this metafiction i think it's a story i'll be reading for a long time hmm. And that's maybe the, the greatest compliment, you know, you can give a writer, right, is, is that I'm going to, I, I loved it on the first read, I'm going to need to come back to this. Uh, I, and and I, I want it to be exciting to, to come back to this as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see we got the note that we have 15 minutes to go in the, in the panel. Um, let's see here. So I thought we might, uh, we might see if we've had, uh, if we've had questions. It, uh, I don't see any here. And Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so here's a question for everybody. Uh, who are his progenitors? Uh, where is his position in the Pantheon? Anyone want to take a stab at, uh, at who his, his antecedents are? Well, I mean, you have, to, you have to look at Bradbury, I think, and you have to look at Kafka. I mean, I think, Kafka, I think there's a lot, a lot of Kafka-esque elements you know, some stories from Kafka's work, you could absolutely see Jeff tackling the same story. Like, um, what's the song about the mouse, Josephine, the mouse singer? I mean, mm -hmm. that is like a story that Jeff could put a, an amazing spin on, but it takes a certain kind of writer to even think that I could write a story like that. Kafka was one, Ford is another. Uh, I think Bradbury is a good, a good touchstone. Um, Honestly, uh, I was looking back at my notes from 2010, and I had this note about um, Steve, Stephen King as written by Bill Bryson. Um, but but um, it, the interesting difference to me is that like Stephen King, I, I feel like often plays with tropes, and but ultimately like there is a there is a battle that must be had, and there will be some you know a winner and a loser. And I think in a Jeff Ford story. Um, like the thing that has to happen is that is this acceptance that your reality has changed, which is not the, so it's like Stephen King, but with a different, um, with a different result. That's interesting. He's, hasn't he mentioned, um, there's a Stephen King story in uh, the, col the, the collection Hearts in Atlantis. And I think it, maybe it might even be called Hearts in Atlanta. It's, it's about a bunch of guys uh, who are sitting around uh, playing cards compulsively. Um, and they're all waiting to be drafted or, or they don't know what's going to happen. And, and Ford has spoken of his admiration for that particular story a, 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 number, of, uh, a number of times. I like um, him better than King myself, but um, definitely. yeah. Yeah, he, um, anyone else, are there other thoughts on, on where Jeff comes from? I think there's, I don't know enough to, to say definitely, but the sense of myth, I mean, he is making his own myths and he's making his own kind of pantheon it's a myths that, that intersect with each other. So I think there's something mythical about him. So I would, I would say the old myths as well, like Jeff's creating his own myths. He's also one of those writers that, that uh, feeds upon his own uh, personal mythology. Uh, somebody like, you know, different in every other way, but somebody like Faulkner, right, who's like always writing about Yakna Patofa County. Um, Ford returns again and again and again to like the Botchtown uh, scenario. Some of those characters recur. Um, there's another story set there in, in the new, uh, new collection as well. Okay. Sherwood Anderson. I, I didn't oh, even think great. of that before. Yeah. That, that yeah. would be an interesting yeah. touchstone too, just yes, in terms of good. like yeah. the willing to take on, um, willingness to take on the gross grotesque um and elo yeah i don't know it, honestly look at people closely like yeah. Anderson does. yeah i uh, actually i'm, I'm going to skip ahead to, to a question that, that seems to re relate to this you're talking about the autobiographical elements of jeff's stories those of you who know jeff and lynn and the family do you feel that that knowledge enhances your reading uh, which must be quite a unique thing what do you uh, what do you think? I mean, I so I only met Jeff once briefly. 
and but I but I know him on Facebook, so I don't know him that well. But here's the trick: I feel like I do know him quite well. Like I feel like I can confidently because he has that that thing about him, that openness about him, um, almost like um, like we know his dogs. You know, we know about Lynn from the story, um, and that's that makes you feel like you know him, even though you might maybe don't so much. I mean, I don't know him very, I don't know him. <laughs> uh, so, but from the stories, I think like Emma was saying, you know, he has put him so much of himself and his family uh, into the stories. Uh, they may be completely different <laughs> from the real people in real life, but the people on the, on the page, I feel like I know very well. And I get excited when I see them again in another version. Also possibly related to this, can we tell from his stories that he uh, is or was uh, a literature professor? Well, he includes that in a whole lot of stories. Um, there, are a lot, there, there are a few stories about his uh, students too that, that touch on um, some, of the, some of the classes he's taught and some of the interesting students. Um, I, I remember that there's one, of, there's a story about one of his students or that, that touches on a student who was a murderer like, yeah. like one of his students turned out to, yeah. And then there's, a, there's that other story about the student, the girl that's in one of his classes who, who like never speaks, or, but she only- the, the one where he has to fight the angel. The angel, yeah. Well, that's that's, that's another one. Oh, that's yeah, I mean, he, he's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just another, another uh, of the wellsprings of his, of his amazing fiction. He pulls from, pulls from everything in his life, it seems like, and he, ne and he never runs dry. What uh, what Jeff Ford story should be made into a movie? What Jeff Ford story should not be made into a movie? <laughs> I know which one not. I'm just <laughs> which one not? Very enterprise. I don't think I want to see that on screen. You know, when the guy gets infested with the fairies and they all start coming out of him? <laughs> I don't want to see that on screen. I'd like to see, um, I think you could do a great animated version of Daddy Long Legs of the Night. Oh, yeah. mm. I would love to see that. It does feel like that, doesn't it? That that you could see an anthology uh, of of Jeff's stories done in various styles of animation. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, you know, that would be uh, so. Uh, Hollywood or whoever, if you're listening, as I know you are. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I, I wouldn't want to see maybe not one movie, but I'd like to see like like an Amazon Prime, you know, where it's just you get oh, yeah, yeah. different pieces, and then you get to see reoccurring stuff in each and each episode. We could the, just do all the Jeff Ford stories at that point. Yeah. Just do all the autobiographical <laughs> yeah. ones and have a He plays himself one. every time. I was like, oh, that's Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, uh, is it Love, Death, and Robots? Is that yeah, the, the series thinking. right yeah. now? Yeah. You know, something like that, where it's stories just, are different just, lengths, different styles. Just, just make season three the, the Jeff Ford season. The Jeff Ford season. <laughs> it, uh, so here's what seems to be a, almost a sort of a trivial pursuit question. What is the story Jeff read at the KGB that made people cry? The story, like there's only one. Yeah, so, well, I guess so. I think I, that's I, the one you were talking about earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and it was. It was. You already mentioned it, it was the jewel. Um, the jewel, jewel ran. The jewel ran. I heard the him read that. I think at ReaderCon also, and yeah, that was that. It was. It was emotional. Yeah. What I would you say so about funny. Jeff's uh, reading style? If, if you've heard him, if you've heard him read, like, how would you describe? Mm -hmm. He has. I, I feel a very unique reading style. How would you describe that? It's a very much a, a storytelling style. Like it's Jeff telling you a story. Um, <laughs> and it kind of transfers when, when you read it. For me, it transfers when I'm reading his stories now that I hear him reading stories to me and you remember it. There, there's some writers who are like that. Like um, I, I was a big fan of John Crowley's work uh, before I heard him read for the first time. When I heard him read, it was revelatory. I suddenly... That was my way to get even deeper into the story. Now, when I read anything by Crowley, I hear him reading it. Absolutely the same thing with Jeff. Although Jeff is, is I mean, Crowley is a very kind of laid back, confident reader. Uh, so is Jeff in his way, but Jeff is a much more like, uh, uh, I, I would say, because his personality is different. He's a more plain spoken individual and that, that comes across in his, in his readings. There's a handful of people who I just will go like drop everything to, to hear Absolutely. their readings every time. And it's, it's Jeff, it's Liz Hand, it's uh, Zizi Claiborne and Andy Duncan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for very different reasons, right? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, well, at, at, that seems to be all the questions we've, we've gotten. Are there more? We'll see if we get more questions in a, in a second or if we've, uh, if we've so thoroughly answered the questions that nobody has anything more to, uh, anything more to ask. Um, you know, I, I, I just wanted to, to throw in um, many years ago when my friend Laird Barron was, was writing his first novel, um, the, the Croning, Jeff actually gave him advice that, that I, I was remembering when you were all talking about the audacity of his, uh, of, of his prose. And Jeff said, you know, it's your first novel. And, and so your natural impulse is going to be to play it safe. To, to write, you don't want to rock the boat too much and, and you don't want to put people off. And, and he said, fight that impulse, fight that with, with everything you've got, you know, go nuts. Um, and that does seem to transfer over. It's, it's in keeping with, with his own approach based on, on what everybody's, uh, everybody's identified in his, in his work. I, I remember uh, this is going to, I hope this doesn't come across as star crit. Okay. I was listening to an interview of you, John. <laughs> with um, Daniel Brown. And Daniel Brown said he'd been to a workshop with, um, with Jeff. And he said that, he asked Jeff how, how he came with stories, how he planned. And Jeff said, well, you just, you get the stories, you get the characters, and then you just follow them. You just follow what they do. And I think Daniel Brown was like, oh yeah, thanks Jeff. I thank you for that. <laughs> Um, but, but that was it. And, and, and I really liked your response to it. And can you even remember what your response was? I can't paraphrase you. But you I, were talking- I, I do not. No, I'm, I'm sorry. It was good, John. It was good. Um, you, were, you were talking about how um, Jeff has spent a, Jeff may say that, but he spent a lifetime studying stories and thinking about stories and writing stories. So it's not just that he, follow, he does follow the, the characters and, and follows what they do and writes down what they do. But it also comes from from a from a lifetime of being involved in stories. It's not just something that magically happens. It's a it's a lifetime of stories that enables him to do that. That was pretty good. Wow. Was I, good, I, John. I, yeah, was good. that was. That was <laughs> I don't know who. Maybe there was another John Lang in there. You know, my my double or the oh. double of my double. So, um, one more question: uh, Is he a city writer or a country writer? <laughs> Well, I, I know that, at least for me, what I, what struck me about some of his stories was just seriously how grounded they were wherever he was, but it tended to be, I feel like he was outside the city, like New Jersey, like he knows New Jersey, like, I, I'm assuming he knows New Jersey, like like he's water that was poured from there. Uh, so it, if that is, but it's not, it's not Jersey, this, like in the city, it's like, it's it's the backwoods, you know, it's places that most people don't want to go or only heard about. Um, so I feel like maybe country writer. Mm. Yeah, but if you if you read like uh, the the new the Ahab's Return, I mean he absolutely nails New York City, um, mm. and he nails New York City of the time in which he's writing. But also just like whatever it is that makes New York City New York City, he nails that too. So I think he's a writer that uh, that sinks his taproot into wherever he is physically, and uh, and he draws up something authentic. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping, we're just about ready to wrap up. I hate to, I hate to have to, if I feel like the conversation is sort of just getting going, you know, like there's, there's, there's more still that we could say, but um, closing thoughts. I'm, I'm sorry to have to, to, as I say, bring things to a close, but uh, let's, uh, let's go back to, uh, let's just do alphabetical again. Emma, some closing, a uh, closing thought for us. Can you, Cycle back to me. I need to think about it. Okay, uh, uh, Sarah, because I'm I've learned the alphabet. Sarah, closing thought. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just go back to the Empire of Ice Cream again. No one asked us the question if you could recommend one story, but uh, I love the fact that that story is um, about a guy who who writes a fugue and it is one in its own. Like he describes the structure of the music he wants to compose. And then the story itself is, is composed in that way. And there are all those same questions that, that I've referred to earlier about acceptance of your own reality. And um, so, so I'll just end with an answer to that question, which is that's the story I started with and that's the story I'll, I'll always go back to. Okay, Cameron, how about you? Um, you know, I started rereading a lot of stories, uh, going back to the short stories for this panel and 
Um, it just, you know, it's actually helping me uh, for a story that I'm writing right now. So if you are a writer, I would say read Jeffrey Ford as you're writing a story. You know, things will just kind of pop open for you. Paul, how about you? Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm the kind of uh, asshole reader who like reads a story and is like, what's wrong with it? You know, where's, where's it going wrong? Never have, have felt that with, with Jeff's work. And I always feel, in fact, that he, he really is getting better. I don't think he's reached his limit as a writer yet. Emma, how about you? I, I mean, I'm going to echo what Cameron said. I think if you're a, a writer, especially if you're a short story writer, it, it, it really is a, an education reading uh, and a fun education reading Jeff's stories. Like it, it will help you with your own craft. And I, I got a whole list of favorites The Blameless, uh, Mount Shari Galore. I love that. It's bonkers. Um, and one of my favorites. Is Twilight Pariah, um, the novella, which uh, Paul Tremblay described as Richard Linklater meets Stephen King meets Indiana Jones meets Jeff Ford. And I don't think there can be, uh, I mean, what else do you want in a story? <laughs> and, and that will be a great place for us, uh, I think, to wrap up. It's, uh, so uh, thank you so much for our four brilliant panelists. Uh, if uh, you, if Jeff. Jeff Ford is watching, Jeff, we love you. Keep writing. Hi, uh, and thanks to everybody else for uh, for watching us. Take care, everybody. Thanks, John.